Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Friday Morning at the Fun House with Martin Popoff. Good morning, my friend. How are morning, you? Pete. How are you? Doing, doing fine. Doing fine. Looking forward to this one as well. Very, very cool concept. Yeah. Sunny day in New York. Sunny Beautiful day here in Toronto. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. No it's, smoke. <laughs> no no smoke. smoke from Northern Ontario or BC or you know, Alberta, right? I heard of that. Yeah, I think uh, I think one of our viewers, Armando, was talking about it the other day about how uh, you know there's all this smoke and whatnot, and I was like, "Geez, that does not sound good." It's like meanwhile here, it's like all we've had is either rain or high humidity, yeah. but uh, no rain, no humidity today. So yeah. pretty pretty cool. Nice. So uh, before we get started, uh, just want to let everybody know we've got the brand new in the Prog CT Tranquility shirt in the house in the store link below in case you're interested so uh just got mine the other day I'm wearing it proudly so uh today's topic is all about that album before the big one so these are probably going to be fairly noteworthy bands or very noteworthy bands uh who had a huge album which obviously probably changed their lives forever everybody bought it made lots of money big tours singles all that good stuff what about the album that came right before it how did that album impact <clears throat> or not that big release were there changes that happened to the band the label members anything like that before the big one and was the the one before it stylistically similar or very different did it kind of plant the seeds for what we would get on the big follow-up mega album those are the questions we're gonna we're asking ourselves and we're gonna tackle here so we've each picked five albums of uh and in most cases, I don't know, Mark, would you agree? Most of these ones before the big one, pretty damn good, right? Oh, the definitely. Yeah. 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 All so, in different uh, ways. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what we've come up with here. So uh, I'm going to have Martin kick us off with his uh, first choice. All right. So my first choice, I'm going with U2 October. <clears throat> um, so this is their second album. They followed, uh, it was Boy. Boy was the first one. And, you know, the sound is pretty similar on, um, on Boy and October. And why I wanted to pick this, I, I really like the idea of um, a lot of these bands, there's like an excitement building about the band and you almost feel that they're destined for greatness in some way. And here it's more about the personalities of, of Bono and also his voice and then this distinct guitarist in The Edge. But, you know, this is still pretty murky um, post-punk along the lines of, uh, of an Echo and the Bunnymen. Um, the Cure, uh, the Cure before they became, you know, vastly uh, synthesizery, more like when they were more guitar, bass, and drums. Um, but you can just hear there's kind of a star quality to this, but uh, but maybe the songwriting isn't there, or there's it. it this one, the the thing with this one is it's more about uh, kind of like the sound and the concept of the sound. Whereas you move on to war, war is, I guess, the first big one, because the way this this works is this went platinum. And I didn't check the date on that, but it's probably more like going platinum after war. And boy went platinum. So boy certainly wasn't platinum right out of the gates in America. But war went four times platinum. And I had New Year's Day. We had a band in the 80s that actually played New Year's New Year's. New Year's Day live, actually, and Sunday, uh, Bloody Sunday. But the big difference is they're all they're all produced by Steve Lillywhite. Uh, but the big difference is, I think with War, you kind of get, um, it's a little bit more about the d distinctness of the songs on War, and it's got, it's got a, a, a more of a biting production, and it's more rhythmic. And you get, you know, the, the, the interesting the classic amazing sound of New Year's Day and, and Sunday Bloody Sunday and other things on it. There's a lot of, you know, the drums are a little more intrusive. So that's kind of the big one. But, you know, I could have gone almost with the Unforgettable Fire before the Joshua Tree as well, because uh, Unforgettable Fire was three times platinum. Granted, it's it's a big album itself. And on that one, they're almost back to the murky sound again. But then obviously Joshua Tree is the big one and it's, it's yeah. the super commercial <clears throat> one. It went diamond. But, you know, this is the first one before the big one, you know, seeing war go four times platinum is pretty amazing. So it's Steve Lillywhite producing, uh, you know, he's he's more or less done uh, XTC. Uh, what, what did he do? It was it was. Uh, yeah. In 79 drums and wires. And he did the Peter Gabriel melt Peter Gabriel three. So he had some pretty, pretty neat things, but he's just kind of new into the production chair and uh, and doing this and and frankly october is not that great great a sounding album it's a murky post-punk dreamy dreamscapey album but war like i say is a little more rhythmic and distinct so there you go 
Yeah, they really took off from there, huh? Oof. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I don't even like that later sound very much. Like, I, I don't like it when it got dancey and loud and synthy and jungly and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm, I, but I was bought in full, to, full, fully to you too, you know, around, around the time of Joshua Tree and Un Unforgettable Fire is my favorite one at all. So, yeah, I was kind of on board a bit. You know, I remember hearing like New Year's Day um, and liking that quite a bit. So I, I was kind of following them a little bit. Uh, the, it's almost like for me, the bigger they got, the more I kind of tuned out. But I can't, you can't deny um, the songwriting abilities. And just, there was like an it factor about that band, right? Whether you love them or yeah. not. So, uh, yeah. Sold a lot of records too. I, I couldn't oh, believe yeah. it. I was looking at the later, you know, multi, multi platinum for even those later ones that we think, oh, it's kind of all over for them or whatever it's supposed yeah. to be, you know, like when it's sort of semi all over for Pearl Jam, right? Uh, but no, it wasn't all over. Like they, they sold a lot of records for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one of those bands. I think no matter what they put out, people are going to buy it. That's yeah. just, there, there's not that many of those, right? Uh, you know, we talk a lot here on the channel about those, you know, the legacy bands that, um, you know, people are still, even hardcore fans are still skeptical about the new stuff they put out. U2 is one of those bands and they could basically, you know, put a fart down on a CD and sell it and people will buy it for the most part. And remember that, remember the big controversy when, when it was stuck on everybody's phone, right? Remember yes. Apple? Yeah. And that, yeah. that drove people crazy, right? They oh, I remember that. I'm like, why do I have this? I remember my, <laughs> my mother was like, why do I have this? I don't even know who you two is. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. That, they'll never do that again. Right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, my first choice for today uh, is uh, Ario Speedwagon, Nine Lives, <laughs> released in 1979. So, of course, this comes uh, right before the big one, High Infidelity. Yeah. Uh, couldn't be more different. I mean, so this, this is their eighth record, eight albums. So this band had been slogging all throughout the 70s. None of their albums really selling all that well, but they're building a reputation. They're out on the road constantly. They're this hard tour and Midwest rock band. Uh, you know, a lot of lineup changes. You had Gary, uh, Kevin Cronin singing now full time by here, but he had kind of come and gone from the band a few times. They had Terry Luttrell from Starcastle also fronting the band. Uh, like I said, a lot of, a lot of lineup changes, a lot of um, yeah, albums that are solid, but this kind of mix of like uh, hard rock and Midwestern boogie and not, not very cohesive uh, as far as hit singles, none to be found. And it's, it was, it's funny. It's interesting. It wasn't until the, you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish album that they first, that they first started to get uh, see some sales and have some songs played on the radio. And then they come out with this album, which I think is a fine album. It's a good hard rock album, probably their heaviest album, uh, but not all that accessible. And almost like it's a step back from the album that came out before it, which had a couple singles and is definitely more accessible. Uh, so it's almost like they put this album out because they wanted to, you know, and, and you even look at the cover, the cover is kind of weird, right? It's like they're all dressed up and, and you know, some of them wear uh, ties and some are wearing leather. You got the ladies hanging around. It just kind of gives mixed messages, right? And then, you know, you got the back, but good songs, good, you know, it's a good solid record. It doesn't scream, uh, hit at all and then all of a sudden they turn around and they put out this which is loaded with hits sells like what like 10 plus million copies or whatever whatever it was and this was all over the radio and all of a sudden their hard work I guess paid off but it's almost like for me this album almost doesn't segue into this one the album before this one would have been a perfect segue because that album to me this seems more like the successor to you can tune a piano but you can't tune a fish than this particular one so in this instance i don't think this really foreshadows anything that's going to happen on this album at all this is almost like a little stop gap in the road where they said you know we're just going to put out the album that we want to put out uh if people buy it they buy it if they don't buy it we, they don't buy it but we're just going to we're just going to rock out, put out some solid songs and, uh, and see where it takes us. And this, uh, this actually, I believe, sold less than the album before it. And then this comes out. And you know what? When you have really good songs that are accessible, that have lots of hooks, people will buy it. And especially, you know, this was what, 1980? So, but I still think this is a very solid record. Uh, but in this instance, not really the perfect, the perfect uh, bridge to, to this one. I'm like, which, which one am I holding here? So uh, yeah, so there you have it. So uh, Nine Lives, good album though, good album.
Yeah, that's my favorite one. And you're right. It is probably kind of the heaviest. Um, I just off the top of my head, I can't quite remember, but I think you can tune a piano went gold before they were big. Yeah. And they might even had one other gold in there. So they were having a little bit of success bubbling under, right? Yeah. Like that. lot, so yeah. producer on on high infidelity. Is that Kevin Beamish? Uh, good question. Jeff? Yeah, Kevin Beamish, I think, right? Kevin Beamish, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so he's the one that told me the story about, uh, I think Gary, I might have told this story before, but he said, uh, you know, uh, they, they tried some of those songs off that album. I think I'm getting this right. I, I think I think it was the right band too. But yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it was Gary and, and this. So they played some of the songs off High Infidelity before the album came out. And they were playing them back and Gary's like really annoyed. Like, what is that sound in the mix? Like, what's going on? He goes, that's girls screaming. <laughs> that, that's what you need to do. That's why this is going to work for you, right? And, and it's like he's saying you, you now have the other half of the audience. And, and that actually taught them to, you know, because uh, I think Gary was, was uh, kicking and screaming against doing the big ballad kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, and that was like, like that, that crazy sound. What is that annoying sound in there? That's girls screaming. So, uh, yeah. So I, th I thought that was it's interesting because it's almost like the Nine Lives album is Gary's album. And mm. this is Kevin's album. Right. right? Yeah. Even though I think I, I think this is a, a expertly produced album. And I think Gary sounds ferocious on this album when he does appear. Right. So right. great guitar yeah. player. Much missed. Very <laughs> underrated. All right, my second choice is, um, well, let's do this one next. Um, Twisted Sister with You Can't Stop Rock and Roll. Um, so again, this, this reminds me a little bit of the U2 story, believe it or not, because there was such a bubbling under excitement for this band, starting with the first album, which is just a, a barnstorming, amazing record full of super heavy songs and some anthemic songs. Uh, they, you know, and, and this was a band that was bubbling under, but, but completely not in a record way uh, in terms of having that, that pretty big live club crowd going all the way back to about 1974. So that first album comes out in the UK and it's got some incredible, incredible songs on it, including the title track, Under the Blade. Um, but then this one comes out and they've kind of really smoothed out their sound, straightened out their sound. It's produced by Stuart Epps. Um, you know, it, it doesn't do that great business either, but they do have some success in the UK. Um, I, was, I was checking like, I am, I'm me, um, UK number 18, kids are back, a UK number 32, you can't stop rock and roll, a UK uh, number 43. Uh, so it's interesting. I don't even remember if the UK cover was any different than ours, because when this came out, um, I didn't get an import of it. I got an import of Under the Blade, uh, but but this had pretty large dis distribution right out of the gates, and they were on Atlantic, I believe, already for this. This is this was their first signing. But um, one thing I wasn't uh, sure of, and I didn't know, I always knew it was a gold record, but it only went gold in 1995. So when they put out Stay Hungry, which goes three times platinum, uh, it doesn't drag really anything along. This thing takes a long, long time. In fact, Stay Hungry is double platinum all the way up to 1995. So it's 84 to 95. And so they do a certification, a group certification at that time. And that's when they drag this to gold. But Stay Hungry didn't, didn't really uh, you know, increase the sales of this one. One thing I like about this one, a lot of people like this album as their favorite Twisted Sister. It really goes to that D. Snyder philosophy of we're a mix of Judas Priest and ACDC. It's really straightened out with really straightened out beats. Um, but you know, it does have uh, I Am, I Me, which is almost like a precursor to that we're not going to take it sound, right? So you've, you've got the anthem. Right. And uh, what was the ballad on here? Where the heck is it here? Um, ooh, I can't. Oh, yeah, there you go. You're not alone. Suzette's song. I'm pretty sure that is the one that's a there's there's one ballad on here, I think, maybe even more than one. But so they had that going as well. And they have a song called We're Not Gonna Make It. But really, it's like the kids are back and you can't stop rock and roll feel a lot like the, you know, the um, more like the I, I want to rock type of anthem on on Stay Hungry. I've always considered Stay Hungry as a Peaks and Valleys album uh, with songs heavier, like three or four songs heavier than anything on this, and then three or four songs popier or lighter than anything on this. So this is the really smoothed out album. 
Um, but again, uh, I like this as a choice because um, you just felt like they were going to break at some point. It, it just felt like, you know, this band all, already almost feels bigger than they are. And, and you knew it was inevitable, even with that record, yeah. uh, because it is because it is such an accessible and simple, uh, you know, uh, just absolutely dumbed down, stripped down like an ACDC kind of or a or a post 1980 Judas Priest or even an Angel City, the Angels uh, type, type sound on it. So, yeah, good album. Yeah, and uh, man, I, the amount, you know, living here in New York, uh, there was so much buzz about Twisted Sister for years, actually. I mean, they were like one of the best kept There's underground the, secrets here, uh, especially on the, the follow up there, eh? Yeah. Stay yeah. hungry with that crappy album cover. <laughs> the big unappetizing real, real bone with actual meat on it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you you just knew that they were going to break at some point. I mean, they, they had they just had that whole it factor, right? I mean, from the uh, the kind of the imagery of the band to the music, it was just perfect for the time. And I think the one a perfect example, one of those bands that all their hard work, kind of like the REO thing, you know, all that. I mean, they were out on the road playing long before they started releasing yeah. albums. And uh, I think you knew eventually all their hard work was going to pay off, and it and it totally did. As as fleeting as it might have lasted what it seems when you really look at it right yeah so and a lot like man of war right that early success is is more like tied into the new wave of british heavy metal early success right yeah 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 yep, yep. all right so uh another new york band uh dream theater when dream and day unite from 1989 <laughs> so this is their debut of course uh produced by terry date who had worked with uh you know all sorts of metal bands, Metal Church, and so on and so forth. Would work with Soundgarden and uh, lots of other bands. Uh, so this is uh, MCA Records, okay? Kind of, you know, for an unknown band to be signed just like that uh, to MCA, pretty cool, actually. Um, this gets released to not a lot of fanfare at all. And I remember the only reason I even heard of this is uh, because they were Long Island, you know, from Long Island. I had a lot of Long Island friends in college. And I remember I graduated in 88 and, you know, in 89, I was still going back to school to visit all the old buddies who were still going to school there and whatever. And I remember one of my friends, he played this, uh, he had a cassette of this. He goes, you got to check this out. This band Dream Theater, they're from, you know, out near me. I'm like, all right, cool. So I remember hearing it and being pretty blown away. Uh, I was thinking, you know, I'm not crazy about the singer, but man, musically, that's kind of sounds like a kind of like kicked up rush, you know, maybe a little Fate's Warning, that sort of thing. And uh, but this album kind of came and went. You know, I think uh, musicians who, you know, were trying to listen to all the best kind of like underground metal and things that are going going around were kind of latching on to these guys. I know, <clears throat> you know, the, the big prog rock renaissance was about a year or two away still. Um, but then they came back. First of all, they got rid of the singer, right? So Charlie Dominici is gone. They bring in a guy named James Labrie from Canada. Uh, they get signed to Atco Records. So apparently there was enough going on here where Atco picked them up. Uh, and they got uh, David Prater to, to, to uh, produce their next album. And then all of a sudden you've got images and words, right? Which of course would go gold here and would kind of forever for most people be like the dream, you know, the album that really put Dream Theater on the map to a lot of people still the best Dream Theater album, right? Uh, but I think there's plenty of the seeds on here that would kind of show up on here, but I think they needed the right singer to be able to kind of deliver those characteristic melodies and hooks that this band always seems to have. But I mean, musically, pretty advanced stuff here. Although I think the production, uh, there's a little bit more of a guitar crunch on this album than there is on here. I'm not crazy about the production on this album at all. But I think the, you know, Status Seeker, Fortune and Lies, the Yitzy Jam showed, of course, that's kind of like their answer to YYZ by Rush, sort of. Uh, the Killing Hand, Life Fuse and Getaway, really cool songs. Uh, just not fully realized yet. And I think what this album is missing, musically it's there, uh, all those kind of hooky melodies not quite there yet, but I think on this album and basically everything they've done ever since uh, comes out in full force. So, I, you know, for me, this album had to happen to get us to here. So I think for, for this instance, this is the perfect bridge to this. And uh, but still a really rock solid album. You, nobody ever talks about this album for whatever reason. It's almost like the forgotten Dream Theater album. But uh, I still think it's pretty strong and it had to happen to have this one here. 
Yeah, it's got that messiness of of the one album with the other lead singer, like an anthrax situation, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. always going to be a little off to the side, right? Yeah. And, yeah, you know, Charlie's not a bad singer at all. Uh, he just doesn't quite fit. And maybe, again, maybe it's because of the production. He doesn't quite fit the album all that well. But, like, he put out a couple of albums under, you know, he formed a new band called Dominici back, like, what, 10 years ago or something like that, and put out a couple albums. And they sound really good. He, he basically went back to the whole Dream Theater style because the Dominici band is squarely in this kind of melodic progressive metal style. So he did a couple albums, and then we haven't heard from them since. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Labrie, obviously, was a better fit for this band and i think you know prater's production on images and words just brought out everything that was so special about the band you know you got all these guys writing they're just absolutely virtual musicians and uh, you know you got mike portnoy who is just a you know a real music nerd and loves progressive rock and metal and all those influences so and, you know it was like the perfect storm images and words but when dream and day unite really planted the seeds for what was going to come yeah cool all right uh, okay, so my third choice, um, I'm going with Nirvana Bleach. Um, again, uh, this this whole grunge time was just a magical, magical time for me. I was living in Vancouver at the time. We had a store called Zulu Records. I think it's still there, a different location, but they were getting in all this stuff and I was snapping it all up. It was usually EPs to start with. Um, but um, the Green River album, Rehab Doll and and Nirvana Bleach are probably my two favorite grunge albums of all time. This is just such a rock and heavy, you know, amazing vocals, really, uh, you know, interesting differences in the songs uh, track to track. Um, produced by Jack and Dino, buddy of mine on Sub Pop. Uh, it's got the, you know, the standard Charles Peterson type, uh, although it's a negative image uh, there of the, uh, you know, the hair flying all over the place grunge look. Um, but just a really uh, excellent, excellent album that that really drove home the point of why hair metal had to die sort of thing. Right. Um, it 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 showed it showed that uh, just graphically how it had gotten so far that there really wasn't anything heavy about that anymore. And this was the new ferocious heaviness. That's the other thing about this. It's it's quite heavy for a grunge album as well. Um, and um you know, again, uh, an odd, odd certification situation on this. It's, it was certified gold and platinum on the same day in uh, 1995. So they, they were, you know, whether it's Sub Pop or Geffen or whatever, um, or however it all worked when we get to Nevermind, um, the certification of all this was kind of lazy. Um, but um, Nevermind, of course, is, is Diamond and Beyond. It was a massive, massive album. And this... This album, you know, it's kind of annoying to me, but it only sits at platinum, which is really odd. It's like, where are all those Nevermind fans? Why, why, did, why did not at least 7 million of them get Find Bleach, that. right? Um, you know, there's only three Nirvana albums. It's not hard to collect the whole thing, you know, plus, plus you know, um, the rarities thing and then box sets and everything uh, eventually and the live stuff. But really, there's only bleach, uh, incesticide, or no, in utero, sorry, and uh, and um, never mind in the middle. That's it. They only made three albums, uh, and this is just such an incredibly well put together, um, dirty, dangerous, uh, stoogy, um, hard rocking album. Great pounding drums, killer vocals from Kurt on it, and just uh, and just like a like a new dangerous incendiary way to be heavy and and still to this day it's it's literally that and the green river rehab doll that uh that are my two favorite grunge albums there you go interesting point so never mind sells 10 million plus copies right mm -hmm. that album barely squeaks to platinum after all these years so why is it that all these huge Nirvana fans who love Nevermind couldn't bother to go back and buy the debut. I know. The fickleness of the modern music fan, right? Once again, yeah. rears its head. Yeah. It's like only buy the new one, the, the bright, shiny bell of the moment, and then move yeah. on to something else. <laughs> and then he died. But, you know, it's almost weird because we've seen it, Martin, over the last mm -hmm. couple decades. It's like, you know, a, uh, a major musician or rock star or vocalist whatever songwriter dies and usually you see a big spike in the purchase of the catalog so like you know for all those nirvana legions of fans who came on board with nevermind when cobain died 
you know, you would think that, oh, you know what? Oh, it's horrible. He's dead. I, I got to go out and buy the albums I don't have by them. But it didn't really work that way. Why is yeah. that? Yeah. Why is it that only really that one album was, you know, worth anybody's attention? Yeah. Yeah. And I think some of the narrative at the time was a little bit about the incredible timing of Nevermind. And then this, that, you know, the, the press, the journalists kept harping on this idea that it was a more user-friendly, popular version of Nirvana. I mean, Nevermind's still a pretty heavy album. Um, I love it too. It's a great album. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but, but it, you know, the production's a little better in that on it. But, uh, but you know, I love the production on the old one. I mean, the old ones was just a crushing production, right? A really dirty, dirty, garagey production, but still very heavy. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it is kind of odd. It's, it's, uh, it's almost like speaks to trend, right? Remember there was the whole crazy story about that intern or whatever that was called up, uh, and, and, uh, and made up grunge speak all, all, uh, on the phone, on the fly to this, this, uh, you know, I, maybe it was the New York times or somebody, people magazine, somebody was calling Seattle to like, uh, learn the new grunge lingo lingo. And she made up all these words and, and just to make fools of them in the, in their article, which is really funny. Right. So, so there was a, definitely a trendiness to, to the thing, I suppose, uh, as well, but, um, I mean, most of those records just love them to death. There's, there's nothing wrong with them. The early ones, the late ones of, of the big bands. Anyways, I wasn't so crazy when, when we, when we got into, uh, poppy grunge right um poppy grunge just kind of rubbed me the wrong way number one it was late so it's so it's like biting on the trend and then it was poppy so yeah, yeah. and there it went right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there it went yeah. all right uh 1984 so uh we get this album from a band called white snake called slide it in so i can remember here in the states i don't know how probably wasn't much different up in canada uh you know you didn't see white snake albums in the record racks in the stores uh you would see them in the import section most of the early white snake albums uh you could only buy as imports kind of strange when you think about it because here you got a guy a band led by a guy from deep purple who are a huge band and notable players in the band and uh you know it wasn't until they signed on with Geffen Records here that all of a sudden you started to see Whitesnake Records showing up. And here you have this particular album. Uh, I had had, I think I've had like two Whitesnake albums that I bought as imports before this. So, and this kind of dropped. And again, it, this, we're going back to a day where you didn't know things were coming out. So you just saw them in the record store, right? It's not like, uh, you know, you saw things on the internet like today, you, you know, way ahead of time when things are coming out. Uh, but I think for me, the first time I knew that this was out, was when I heard Slow and Easy on the local FM rock station, which back then uh, were, was still playing new music from new bands or legacy bands uh, and, and trying to push the new albums. So I remember hearing Slow and Easy on the radio and thinking, that is so cool. And then, oh, that's the brand new White Snake. All right, got to go out and get that, pick this up. Great album. So again, uh, as we have seen all throughout the career of White Snake, lineup changes like crazy. Uh, here you got Martin Birch producing the band once again, but you've got, you know, Cozy Powell on board. You've got uh, John Lord. You've got Neil Murray, Mel Galley from Trapeze. And then for the U.S. release, you got John Sykes. So it's like all of a sudden, like you can kind of tell that Coverdale um, is trying to make this band more marketable to the masses. And I think bringing in Sykes was like a stroke of genius, right? Because I think before that, it was just Mickey Moody and Mel Galley. And as great as that is, that's still kind of carrying on the same White Snake tradition that they've had for years, which really wasn't working here. You know, they were touring here. It was hard to get the albums, so they weren't really breaking here. But all of a sudden, you got a couple semi-radio songs. You got uh, Slow and Easy, Love Ain't No Stranger. Uh, I think... Uh, Slide it in, I think I heard on the radio a little bit here too. All of a sudden this starts to sell, right? Mel Galley gets, hurts his hand or we get some kind of affliction with his hand. He's out of the band. Uh, Sykes take over, takes over soul lead, lead vocal, uh, lead guitars. And uh, all of a sudden the band starts to build the momentum of this album. And this album starts to really pick up. I think the, there was a, a, a legion of new fans who, especially here in North America, who had never really heard this band before because you couldn't really get their records, all of a sudden digging this kind of bluesy hard rock. Uh, I remember a lot of people were tossing, oh, they, they have this Zeppelin 
thing to them, right? Based on slow and easy. And all of a sudden this is starting to sell. This band is starting to gain momentum, which of course, a few years later, more lineup changes later, Sykes is, you know, co-writing the album. And then we get this monster of an album, which by the time it comes out, Sykes is gone. The whole band is blown up. He's got to put the band back together again. He decides to uh, kind of pick some people from the, hair metal scene to fill out the lineup. So all of a sudden you've got Adrian Vandenberg and you've got Vivian Campbell and Rudy Sarzo and Tommy Aldridge, which are not really hair metal guys, but uh, you know, they kind of go for the look and, but this all of a sudden takes this concept, all right, of this bluesy hard rock that's still pretty accessible, ups the kind of heavy metal ante with the addition of John Sykes full time doing all the guitars on here. And this all of a sudden becomes an absolute monster. So while I think this one went gold here in the States, I don't think this quite hit platinum, if I remember correctly. And this one does, you know, tremendous multi, multi, multi platinum here business. Here. I, I think, I think, um, slide it in might even be double platinum now. Now did it go that far? Yeah. Bragged. Yeah. I think it's really quite high now. Yeah. But, you know, Martin, this is a perfect instance of uh, because I remember like a lot of people who bought into this when this came out, because, this, you know, when you listen to these two back to back, they they do sound a little bit different because I think Sykes's presence adds that kind of heavy metal quotient to the end of here. But I know a lot of people who bought this first and then went back and got this. Yeah. As why didn't that happen in the Nirvana? Uh, yeah. Example, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, but this uh, this definitely planted the seeds and this kind of broke it out of the ballpark for the band yeah. so uh but yeah i and there's a lot of, i talked to a lot of people who actually prefer this album to that one yeah you know i've never really thought about this before but listening to you talk about that that album you know it almost felt like with slide it in they were running in in the same pack in the same circles as the likes of iron maiden judas priest and scorpions you know a, a heritage band slugging it out trying to get to gold, trying to get to platinum, maybe a little better. Um, and, and then later they're running in a whole different pack. Uh, you know, the, 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 the level has obviously gone up, but it just, it just felt like, um, you know, it, it's almost like it's the difference between early hair metal and late hair metal, but they're also tied in with the with the heritage acts doing well and yeah this. yeah that, that whole like kind of classic classic rock thing um yeah yeah that's yeah that's very true i'm, I'm looking up the uh certifications now yeah you are correct it is now in 1992 it was certified double platinum okay so drag so it, it took right up. like almost a decade yeah yeah, yeah. and we got to remember the reason it would have done that is because it is on geffen and the other ones are united artists yeah. and uh you know it's it's just not none of that stuff got dragged to anything i don't think um yeah. i think i think literally yeah i think they go from no certifications to double platinum yeah essentially yeah. right and it's funny you know i i have this has been one of my favorite albums of all time from since it came out i mean i just absolutely love this album but you know if i were to think about an answer honestly i think start to finish top to bottom this is probably the stronger record i think this stands out for me more because you know there are just some tremendous songs on here but you know i never need to hear uh is this love again and you know here i go again obviously is a, a the band remade from an earlier version on, a, on another white snake yeah. album but i i think this is probably their true true classic because i think it perfectly exemplifies all that the band was from the yeah. beginning and yeah. what they were kind of moving into. Right. Yeah. We actually did a contrarians episode where I picked saints and sinners as my favorite white snake album, That's but it's so amazing. close to slide it in. And for years and years, I was a huge ready and willing guy. Right. I really, yeah. really loved that one. As and well. it's great. You bring both of those albums up because when you really listen to the, all three of those albums, you just, and even uh, come, come and, and get it. Yeah. yeah. Come and get it. They're very similar to this. Yeah. They're yeah. very similar. You know, yeah. the, the trouble album, you know, the really early stuff you can hear a little, you know, they're still kind of finding their way, but man, all those albums you just yeah. mentioned are so similar to this. Uh, you know, again, you got, uh, and those all feature uh, Mickey Moody and Bernie Marsden on guitars, but for the most part, the, the kind of uh, focus of the band is very, very similar. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, okay. So my number two choice, I went with um, ZZ Top El Loco. Here we go. 
in my uh, six six pack CD box here. Yep. The uh, the controversial one with the with the remix uh, on it, right on on a lot of it. Um, but El Loco is a, is a really interesting case for this album before the big one thing because um, it was a step down for them. A they were already on Warner Brothers now, and they and they so they came back after a three year hiatus with Diguello, which went platinum, yeah. and then El Loco only goes gold, which absolutely surprises me. And this is an even more extreme case of uh, of this you know why didn't the fans go back because as far as i can tell it's still only at gold which is really bizarre to me because we know there's a lot of funny things that go on with certification so there's there's backstories to a lot of this stuff but being on warner and having all the big albums on warner too i find it really odd that uh, that this hasn't gone back for a certification much bigger because the other reason i think it's really strange is, you know, I look at the track listing of El Loco and Tube Snake Boogie was on the radio all the time. Um, Layla is is a ballad. Um, and I remember hearing that on the radio. Um, it's So Hard is a ballad. I remember that on the radio. Pearl Necklace was the other big hit. So it had the two big hits on it. Um, uh, Party on the Patio. I remember hearing that on the radio. I remember hearing most of this record on the radio. And the other thing about it, which is kind of funny, it's their most commercial album, I think. Um, it's got the most conservative production sound. It's, it doesn't have that, you know, that that really cool, obscure sound that Deguayo and Tejas has. It's just a straightforward conservative production. Just really, I, I call it the uh, the Steely Dan ZZ Top album in a way. Um, and uh, and obviously, what happened is they had a radical, radical shift in sound and a couple years between it. But um, you know, Billy was working with Lyndon Hudson, who was who was getting them all teched up, uh, and they were coming up with these these cool drum grooves and this you know certain BPM for dancing and all that kind of stuff, and um, and came up with that very mechanistic sound. So there's a big, big shift in sound at this point, point. Uh, and that's kind of one of the interesting things about this, I suppose. You know. I suppose there must have been some panic in the Warner camp and maybe a little bit in the ZZ camp itself about how they, they go and make their most commercial kind of comedic lighthearted album with ballads and stuff. And uh, you know, and, and the sexual double entendres and all that stuff and, and put this absolutely perfect sterling clean production on it. And it actually sells less than the album before, which is really weird. It's got the great album cover. It's got a new image, it's got the beards and the hats and all that. Um, so it's just really odd to me that that album has not sold that well. I think most ZZ fans are not huge fans of it either. Um, I, I find there's there's tons of entertainment all over it. Um, but, you know, I would rate it a, a fair ways down as well. I mean, if if anybody was to say anything, they might say it's a little uninspired, perhaps. Um, De Guayo was certainly quite inspired. I, I think Tejas is, is a great album, uh, Overlooked. But yeah, they, they went to a, a very different sound, and then they had a, a platinum plus. In fact, uh, what is it? Um, actually, El Oak only went number 17 on Billboard. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think we might be into the 20 into the 20 millions on a uh, on eliminator oh, there it's got to be worldwide yeah, maybe be. um but yeah it was absolutely huge as were the rest of them and then of course after burner is eliminator two blah 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 i think that's seven times platinum it's either seven or five one of those two so yeah in interesting choice with that one um same label very different sound yeah um i mean deguayo from I don't know I'm just my perspective here Degueo is a pretty rocking album you know fairly accessible um sold pretty well I think you know I remember like the ZZ Top doing a fair amount of business when that album came out and that yeah. was really the album that you know I was well familiar with them but that was the album that really grabbed me onto their music and you know El Loco is really accessible but maybe a little too laid back yeah but then again, you know, like you said, a lot of songs played on the radio, a lot of favorites of many people on that particular album. And then all of a sudden, you know, Eliminator comes out and granted the sound is a little bit different, but extremely accessible and blows up beyond belief. So like kind of like what happened with that album, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe because it is a little laid back and you mentioned uninspired. And I think that that's probably a good, good term to use because I do find that album just lacking in excitement a little bit, although I think yeah. the songs are strong. 
Yeah, groovy little hippie pad. I want to drive you home. Ten foot pool. So there's so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of this laid back, smooth, reclined kind of music on it, right? Yeah, and maybe that's why. Hmm. But it but it is interesting how you have the, the the kind of the bookends to that album both do very very well. Yeah, and it's just it just goes to show you that no matter how much people say they love a band you're only as good as the songs that are on the album, right? So, uh, and, you know, big hit singles are so important to, to a lot of these albums. It's like, you know, and then, I, you know, although those, there were plenty of the songs played on the radio from that album, I don't think any of them were a big smash, right? So, yeah. I mean, we, we could do a whole show on these, you know, really solid albums that didn't sell because they didn't have hit singles, especially like, you know, from the late seventies throughout the eighties and the early nineties. It's, it's just crazy how, important that is because i think a lot of those big albums draw in fans that weren't necessarily hip to the band before just because of those hit singles yeah never bought anything prior and won't buy anything afterwards but they bought that one album because of those massive singles yeah for sure yeah cool all right speaking of massive albums so uh this album that i'm going to talk about here also did really really well but it didn't do nearly as well as the one that came after it. But this, uh, the album is uh, from 1975, uh, Fleetwood Mac, self-titled. So here is, a, this is a perfect example of the setup and then the home run, right? So here you've got this band and this is, geez, how many albums they have up before this? A, a ton, maybe 10, I don't know. They've been, yeah, they've been around already for quite a long time. Yeah. They've multiple different lineup changes and eras. You know, you got the Peter Green era, which is all the British blues stuff. And then that band kind of in Peter Green leaves. Danny Carawan stays a little bit. They bring in the guy, Bob Welch. Okay. All of a sudden he injects this new kind of California rock sound, a little jazzy, a little bit of the blues remains, a lot of pop influence come in. They release a string of amazing albums with Bob Welch in the band on guitars and vocals. Christine McVie becomes a full-time member of the band. Danny Carawan winds up leaving. They bring in some other singers and things like that. A lot of line of changes, but some really, really strong albums in the Bob Welch era. But just the, the general public not really latching on. It's almost like the, the original fans of the blues style aren't really accepting the new style. Uh, you know, eventually they're starting to bring in some fans, but th these albums aren't setting the world on fire. Uh, and it's really interesting when you look back on the career of Fleetwood Mac, it's like you have, I, I always talk to people who they either just love the stuff from this album on, or they like the Peter Green stuff. And everybody forgets about the Bob Welch era, which I think to me is, is some of the gems in the whole catalog, but that's uh, for another day. So they bring in, so there's this, this duo uh, out from California called Buckingham Nicks. So uh, Stevie Nicks, Lindsey Buckingham, they released this, uh, this album, which again, does nothing, but you know, you listen to the album, it's actually a pretty good album. Uh, somehow Mick Fleetwood, John McVie stumbled upon them. Uh, they're in need of some new blood because Bob Welch is gone and uh, they decide to bring Buckingham Nicks into the band to kind of try and change things up and, and move in a, in a different direction. So they released this album in 75. It becomes a quick and massive hit. I think 7 million copies, I think they're up to to this day. A uh, bunch of, you know, Rhiannon, uh, Over My Head, Landslide, all these like real iconic songs, you know, now that we view as iconic songs. And all of a sudden, the world is watching and listening to Fleetwood Mac for the first, really for the first time ever on a global perspective. Uh, and of course, this paved the way for this, which has basically sold like three or four million times more, three or four times more uh, than that previous album. Uh, this is one of the biggest selling albums mm -hmm. of all time, one of the most iconic albums of all time. But they're kind of, they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, I think you can hear the confidence of the band here. Maybe it's the cocaine. I don't know. Uh, and, but this is the, the perfect segue, that perfect step to the massive album. And like I said, these really go together because then, you know, you listen to the follow-up to Rumors Tusk, which doesn't really sound like either one of these. And the, uh, you know, the Bear Trees and all those other albums of the, the Welch era has elements of this, but there was something magical about having the two female singers and Lindsay sang, you know, uh, lead vocals as well. He's got a really different guitar style. All of a sudden, this 
British blues band has become like this California rock band and a pretty dynamic one as well. And I think the songs are all ex highly accessible. And th this album is a joy to listen to. Uh, it really, really is. And uh, so that's, that's my choice here. Uh, the perfect, the perfect segue album. But uh, in this instance, it did actually really, really well. Yeah, so similar album covers too. And and yeah. literally, I mean, I, I often can't even remember which songs are on which one. They just go as a pair <laughs> together so much. Such a distinct sound. Like you say, I mean, it's a really good point. I mean, that one of the big reasons is is all those vocalists. Yeah. Um, and also just this this strange, simple, egoless sound you know, in a band with a lot of egos but other than that i mean the the sound is, is like is like we're all here just to service the song sort of thing right yeah and, and you know what i think that's one of, one of the reasons in my opinion why the bob welch records didn't really work for most people uh is stylistically they're all over the place i mean every album is like from song to song it's like something totally different and while someone like me can appreciate that and i really enjoy that and i think that there's a lot of brilliance on all those albums when you're thinking about uh appealing to the masses that's not necessarily a good thing people like something that they can easily relate to and get into i mean these two albums are immediate you play them instantly, all these hooks yeah. and tight instrumentation and, the, you know, the three different vocalists and they all sound amazing. And there's something to be said for that. Whereas the Welch era albums, you know, or even the Peter Green stuff, that's it's got a very select niche audience where this it was ready made, whether they knew it or not at the time was ready made for the masses. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, my last choice for today is this one here. And Justice for All, Metallica. Um, so what I like about this choice is that um, essentially you've got a band that was, was universally beloved immediately with Kill 'Em All. It was like they're inventing a new kind of music. Then they just kick it up an incredible notch with Ride the Lightning, which is still my favorite Metallica album. Yeah. Uh, Master is considered... You know, when I've done these polls for my books, um, the greatest heavy metal album of all time, it often wins that poll. And then they do something completely different. They lose Cliff Burton in, in that in that tour bus accident. I think it was Sweden, right? Um, Jason Newstead comes in from Flotsam and Jetsam. And this has the notorious uh, lacking bass sound on it. Um, but that's one thing I really like about Metallica is that they is that um, I in fact I did an episode of History in Five Songs just looking at all the different productions that they did right. Um, they were always very fearless with production. They did a lot of strange things with production. It, it, you know, not so much the Black Album, but certainly Load and Reload, and then certainly Saint Anger, and then certainly Back Again uh, with some some other you know problematic things later on, Death Magnetic or whatever, you know, with the with the Red Line sound or whatever but on this one you know this is the one there was so much debate about uh, how it didn't have any bass this Fleming Rasmussen uh very very techie sound I often I often sort of maintain I I, I you know maybe a lot of people know this or think it but I kind of forget it sometimes that this probably had a lot of uh effect on Pantera coming up with that that big crazy Terry Date sound that you get on Cowboys right with that with a lot of cut to the drums but what I like about this record is that they're on this great trajectory. Everybody loves them. They're like the greatest metal band of the of the new baby band. You know, we're past new wave of British heavy metal. We're now into a whole new generation. Um, but they but they completely change it up. They just say, you know, we're going to go so uncommercial, even compared to what we did on Master. And we're going to have these long songs with a lot of parts in them. And we're going to put on the double album, um, you know, and a dot, dot, dot and justice for all. And, and the album cover art is a little more subdued. Right. You know, the colors aren't that great on it. It's just kind of messy and weird, um, getting a little political. Um, so I, I really like that they did that. I mean, and on my Facebook, there was, there's been some talk lately, a bit of debate about the idea of selling out uh, and Metallica. I mean, did Metallica sell out uh, when they did the Black Album? Because it is, um, you know, they, they certainly didn't go hair metal on it, but what they, I guess they did do is what a lot of metalheads really love and might have even wanted from Metallica, and I certainly was asking Metallica for this too, is the idea, I would love to hear some shorter, slower songs that, that aren't as thrash, you know, like what, oh, what, this great band, what could they do if, if they did 
shorter and slower and tried that out. And Metallica are such awesome, smart metalheads that they're thinking just like their fans at that point. It's like, man, I, I miss I miss the Black Sabbathness in our sound. I miss the heaviness. So and Justice has that one thing kind of lacking for it is it's almost like an extreme black metal production in that it's not very heavy sounding of an album because of the production and because of so many parts and it, and it being so proggy. So being the, the, the smart metal heads they are, they're more thinking it, it has nothing to do with selling out. It's more like, I want, I want that Sabbath back in our sound. And that's kind of, and, and, you know, they're excited a little bit by the grunge scene as well, but they certainly weren't excited about the hair metal scene. So they come up with the black, black album, which of course is way, way past diamond. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I loved the advanced single and I, I quite like the Black Album. I found it a little almost too slow and boring a little bit, like our discussion about, you know, uh, slow Dio and things like that, right? You know, how, how I'm not a big fan of slow Dio. Um, but um, so, so it's interesting when you think of that album, you could, I, I could see how people could look at the Black Album as a total sellout or somewhat of a sellout. But I think their hearts were in the right place. They're just fearlessly trying something different again because and Justice sold well as well. So I mean, they, they could have stuck with that, yeah. and they were they were on a path where they were absolutely hugely respected for four records in a row, all four of them, uh, even though they're growing very rapidly, and yet they 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 break that up. So so here they are, successful band. They aren't they aren't Black Album successful yet, but they're they're a big successful band. And they blow it all up to make the black album. Now, granted, it it was it was uh, uh, you know objectively a more commercial sound, and it did amazing for them. And the fans still loved them, and uh, they became the biggest metal band in the world after that. So there you go. In interesting, interesting thing for them to do uh, for this for this eighty eight album versus the ninety one album. Yeah, you know what? I, I uh, completely different musical genre but i kind of look at those early metallic albums leading up to and justice kind of like yes leading up to tales from topographic oceans hmm. yeah like you could kind of see where they were going and then yeah. they put out this ma magnum opus that is just so dense and complicated that it goes over half the people's heads and it's yeah. almost like by the time they're done with same thing with like rush hemispheres by the time the band is done doing that album and tour they are exhausted they're like all right we did that we don't want to do that again we need to move into something that's a little bit easier a yeah. little bit like yeah. right i mean so yeah. you know and justice is a pretty dense, complex album. It's just all these intricate riffs and drum parts and just, you know, I love it for it. I, I mean, when And Justice came out, uh, I agree that I think the production is not heavy, but the songs are very heavy. And I like the slowed down nature of some of the stuff on there. And I think that's, they decided to go in that style for the Black album, but condensed right and obviously we don't want these big 10 minute long songs and all that sort of thing and you know the funny thing is most of us who were metallica fans at the time fully embraced the black album i mean i listened to it a ton i loved it at the time yeah over the years i think i like it a lot less than i used to but maybe that's just because of overexposure to it right and yeah. maybe over time i'm like well i kind of prefer the more faster speedier complex metallica than the more kind of mainstreamy metallica but there's still plenty of that you know classic sounding metallica stuff on the black album but yeah i uh i like and justice for its uh kind of willingness to go to places that they never went before yeah fearless creativity right and they and they did that all through their career granted you know they take a long time between albums we we've yeah. talked about this before how, how it's surprising how few albums metallica put out yeah. right but uh, but they're long albums and, yeah. and they're, they're usually doubles and there's an ep coming and <laughs> right so there's 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 a lot of material there um but uh yeah the, the one last thing i want to say is that um you know, Lars would talk at the time in interviews about simply wanting to have a, a heavier thing happening at the drum end of things, because because on this, it doesn't you know, when you're going, do, 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 it doesn't sound heavy, but but, you know, he wants a fat groove back in the band. Right. So so in a in a way, 
Well, in, in a lot of ways, or you know, the Black Album's a heavier album than than the previous one, and then in some ways, and Justice is the heavier album. It's it's the more cult album, right? Yeah. Um, and and cult and heaviness go together, just like in, in black metal, right? Um, but they're such smart metalheads that they realize there there are a few different definitions of heavy, and they brought one of them back that that they had been missing, um, you know, on the Black Album. Yeah, yeah. That's a great choice. All right, my final one for today is uh, from 1984, once again, all right? Um, Europe, The Wings of Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, this comes before uh, the final countdown a couple of years later, which uh, makes Europe a household name. But, you know, by this, at this point in time, they're on a, a little-known label called Hot Records, <laughs> How hot were they? Well, they obviously didn't last too long, so they weren't that hot, I guess. Um, some lineup changes. So, you know, the, the band has an album before this, then they released this album. And I remember buying this. I actually got this before the final countdown and thinking, you know, what a terrific, you know, again, at the time, you weren't really, we weren't really tossing around power metal. Uh, at this time, you know, you had guys like Ingve. there was this neoclassical metal thing that was just starting to, to, to be a popular thing on the, uh, the metal scene. And to me, this just sounded like an extension of early rainbow, little deep purple and then with that thing that whole kind of gothic metal thing that 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 neoclassical thing that Ingve was all of a sudden introducing you know the first Alcatraz album and all that sort of thing and a hot album with some absolutely killer songs you had this great vocalist you had this guitar player who could shred but came up with really good riffs good solos and you know more importantly just really good classic sounding metal stuff uh, you know, like Storm Wind, Screams of Anger. I mean, you know, the uh, Wings of Tomorrow, the title track. There's just great songs on here. They were a little catchy. Uh, I think you can hear that accessible nature of this band. And Joey Tempest, really good singer. Probably a lot has to do with him. Uh, but they, are a, they were able to write challenging hard rock and metal tracks uh, that clicked with you instantly. So then they have a couple lineup changes. So they, uh, Tony Reno, the drummer is gone. They bring in Ian Hoagland and then they bring in Mick McKaylee, uh on keyboard. So now they have a full-time keyboard player. Whereas on the first two albums, made a little bit of keyboards here and there, not a hell of a lot. Uh, they released the final countdown. All of a sudden it's these big deep purple angel uh, rainbow style keyboards, big kind of arena rock choruses. Uh, the band has a huge hit internationally forever, I guess. The, the final countdown carries like this kind of ballady, syrupy hit, you know. Um, but, you know, throughout the album, some really good stuff on here as well. But that all that like kind of neoclassical early power metal thing that was going so strong on this album, kind of gone. But what they replaced that with, again, clicked with the masses. And, uh, you know, we've talked a couple of times throughout the show about the, how hit singles can really drive sales of albums. And the final countdown and Carrie did big business. They were all over MTV. All of a sudden, Europe are like the new darlings. Right. And, uh, you know, but then, of course, John Norm, their guitar player, was like, I'm not sure I like this direction. I'm out. They bring in another another player. Uh, they continue in that direction for another album or two. And then they've split up for a while. They regroup. And now they've kind of gone back to their roots once again for the last like 20 years or however long it's been. And it's just it's it's been interesting to watch the career of this band from where they started to where they got really big and to where they wound up again. It's been almost like they've come full circle. Uh, but, you know, you hear a lot of similarities in these two albums, at least from like, uh, you know, with the hooks and the melodies are concerned. But musically speaking, I mean, this is pretty heavy. This really isn't heavy, but it's a good, good hard rock album that's really accessible. Uh, but obviously, this is what the masses wanted to hear. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's like, and the 88 album is not very good at all. What is that called? The Prisoners of, and they, I think they have a 91 something. Those, yeah. those two, I think there's two in there that aren't very good. My favorite Europe albums are the last three, pretty much the last three or four. Amazing, amazing band. Love them to death. Play them all the time. And the first one, the self-titled one from 83 is like, absolutely killer swedish frost core 220 volt axe switch overdrive yep. uh, you know highway child uh who, who else would you throw in? oz from finland you know that really incredibly um 
you know, frosty gothic, you know, in the future to come, those songs, man, that album is so good, right? Um, but yeah, that that middle period. And then, and then, you know, I, I guess part of the reason they're doing great, I mean, obviously that keyboard lick from that song, but also um, you know, they're they're they, they've got something going against them being Swedish. But then maybe it's like, hey, they're Swedish. That's kind of cool too, right? And they're good-looking guys and all they're that stuff. Good-looking guys, yep, yep. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, it's it's and that the other funny thing about that song, which we all hear all the time, the verse is pretty rocking and pretty heavy and pretty Swedish frostcore, right? Uh, you know, it's it's really Euro, right? Um, but uh, I don't. Yeah, and it. That, yeah, that's I, I I've never disliked the final countdown. But yeah. I, I'm, I'm amazed, and I, I God, I've had this discussion so many times over the years. I'm amazed at how many people claim their hatred for Europe based on that song and Carrie, and they haven't yeah. listened to this. They haven't listened to any. It's like they refuse. They're like there's like a blockade put up. Yeah. It's like I hate this, so I hate the band. I hate everything else they've done, but they've never listened to any of the other stuff. Because yeah. I tell you, I'm going to say it again. I've said it a million times. If all you know is this album or a couple songs from this album, and you haven't listened to anything they've done the last decade and a half, you need to stop what you're doing right now and listen to War of Kings or all these. I mean, they're so dark and dark. rocking and heavy yeah. i mean it's just it's like night and day listen to this album for crying out loud wings yeah. of tomorrow a great album doesn't really yeah. sound like this or, yeah there you go yeah. get it right here <laughs> but yeah i mean I've, I've had this argument so many times just people just they just ref, you know all they know is that one song or the two songs and it's like and they automatically they assume that everything else in the catalog they've ever done is exactly the same it's not people it's not at all, not at all. they're literally one of the greatest heavy metal bands going right now from 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 that old guard you know when we talk about bands doing their best music now they're a shining shining example of it. absolutely 100 percent. yep absolutely yep. Cool. Yeah, I, I was. I remember, like when when Europe got back to making music again. What was that? Like late nineties, Martin, early two thousand, something like that. Uh, you know, I also was a little. I, I don't have like fond memories of the two albums that came after the final countdown. They're okay. They have good stuff on there, uh, but for me, that's not my favorite period of the band because I think that was very very commercial sounding, and I was like, all right, whatever. I've kind of moved on from this band, and then when they came back. And they regrouped and John Norm came back to the band and all of a sudden you got these albums that sound like classic Sabbath and UFO and yeah. Deep Purple and Led yeah. Zeppelin. It's like and yeah. dark and still, you know, accessible, yeah. but big riffs and just enough keyboards and, and Joey's vocals, I think, have never sounded better. Yeah. And, and, and album production album. too. Wow. Yeah, the yeah. productions are incredible. Right, right. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's like they came out of like 1977 or something like that. And I'm just amazed at how people just refuse to even give it a chance. Just yeah. absolutely refuse. Like, oh, that terrible band that did the final countdown. I have no interest whatsoever. It's like, you know, it's almost like if you didn't tell, if, if you could get them aside somewhere and don't even tell them what you're playing them and play them one of those albums we just mentioned, they'll be like, oh, this is great. Who is this? Yeah, yeah. Final countdown. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What do you think of that, huh? <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Nice so uh so there you have it everybody martin what do you think can we do a part two of this in a couple of weeks i think so I think all right so. cool yeah you heard it here first but before yeah. we do that i'm going to break the internet right now coming up next friday martin and i are going to rank the albums of king's x Ta -da! <laughs> yeah there i you have go. finally arrived where i can actually do that so uh yeah. must be your most requested thing probably right so. So, yeah I, when's Pete gonna come on board with this yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what it's died down here's the funny thing it's actually died down in recent months when i announced i don't know four months ago or something whenever it was that i i was going out and buying the catalog and revisiting and actually enjoying a lot of the music so since i've said that it's, it's kind of died to a crawl but man before that every other comment on every video is like pete when are you going to do king's x when are you going to do king's x what about king's x what about king's x i can't believe you don't like king's x. well <laughs> sometimes it pays to revisit a band's catalog that didn't click with you early on and i must say i do like quite a bit of the catalog so i have been enjoying it for months and uh so coming up next week ranking the albums the studio albums of king's x here at the fun house so uh stay tuned for that martin what's going on with the uh you've got some books you're working on uh hopefully uh 
Hopefully, yeah. if you guys haven't watched this week, I reviewed Martin's uh, last album, uh, last album, last book in the Rush series, Driven. So if you haven't checked that out, please do. It's a fantastic finale to that series. And coming up on Wednesday, I will be reviewing the Uriah Heat book. So stay tuned for that. So all yeah. good, really good stuff, Martin. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've just got uh, coming uh, soon across the waters. Uh, I'll have that Nazareth one and the Yes one uh, that are like the Uriah Heat one kind of thing but the nazareth one has quotes as well uh, we've been saving all our uri heap stuff myself and my buddy kevin julie from up here we have enough to do probably well easily a trilogy of proper books on heap one day like we have so much interview stuff and and research gathered that we could definitely do what what i did on the rush for heap some some days so maybe it's just kind of on the back burner but yeah martinpopoff.com for all that stuff well, yeah, I was you you had mentioned that in the beginning of the book, and I'm like reading this and I'm like, oh yeah, bring it on, baby, bring it on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm looking forward to that Nazareth one too. That should be pretty, pretty cool. These these books are really gorgeous. Then they, they've uh Weimer's done a really great job on them. Good stuff. Cool. So there you have it, everybody. Uh, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Coming up, uh, let's see, tomorrow, later on, well, in a little while, actually, uh, favorite bands A to Z. We have arrived at R. Uh, R is going to be, is, has been really interesting to kind of pick my favorite band and my runner up that start with the letter R. So stay tuned for that right after this show. And then tomorrow, Stephen Reed from Scotland is coming back on the show for two episodes. We are going to rank the catalog of UK uh, progressive rock act frost as well as polish progressive metal veterans riverside so that's coming up tomorrow and uh, of course before you know it we'll be back with monday 1977 on the hudson valley squares we're going to pick our favorite albums from 1977 with special guest uh jim bocce and mike portnoy martin what are you doing monday you want to join us <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I think so. There you I have it. And, my, and Martin Popwell. Yeah, we'll so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> the more the merrier. So that's coming up Monday on the Hudson Valley Squares. Our favorite uh, three albums from 1977. A great year. So uh, looking forward to that. So uh, stay tuned for that. And a lot more. I am Pete Pardo. We'll see you all real soon. For Martin Popoff, uh, have a good one. Take care.